Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm a bit late on this one. I thought I already had this one on YouTube, but uh, yeah, I guess I just prepared these slides and then never recorded this content, so I'm doing it now. This is the sort of bonus material from the Critical Perspectives on Rational Policy Making Lecture. I don't think I have really bonus material for the next few weeks. Um, if stuff turns up as I go about my business developing this course over the next few years, then I'll add it, but I've got this for now. Um, and I think a lot of stuff from this week will actually be covered uh, in dribs and drabs in different places throughout the next few weeks. So especially, there's a lot of content in here on neoliberalism, and we'll talk about that quite a lot in the weeks on the bureaucracy and commissioning. Um, and not necessarily negatively, and it's not necessarily negative here either, but there's a lot to be concerned about with neoliberalism. All right, let's get into it. Oh, I'm always on the wrong screen. All right, here we go. So I wanted to give you guys a slightly extended uh, example of technocracy from my own field, well-being, public policy. And I think like kind of my transformation away from economics in a lot of ways began with seeing how a lot of the critiques of the way economists think that were made by policy studies scholars, I think didn't apply particularly well to a lot of mainstream economic analysis, but applied wonderfully, just so wonderfully <laughs> to well-being public policy, which made me very concerned. And I have since then been trying to convince a lot of my happiness economists colleagues in particular of a lot of these claims, and I have found it extremely difficult, even though with a PhD in economics I can really speak their language. It's still quite difficult to get across to them. All right, so how does technocracy manifest in well being public policy? Uh, so, if you're interested in reading kind of the, the technocrats as they present themselves, then I would recommend this paper by Paul Friders, Richard Layard, Chris Kreckle, and Andrew Clark. I don't think there are any women in the team, but maybe Sarah Flesch is in there. Um, it was published in 2020 in the journal Behavioral Public Policy called A Happy Choice, Wellbeing as the Goal of Government, or something like that. It was published in a special issue of Behavioral Public Policy that was sort of dedicated to this topic. Most of the other papers in that special issue are constructively critical, so they're not really in favour of this kind of approach, but basically the idea in this paper is that well-being should be the goal of government, well-being should be defined as the maximization of life satisfaction, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, not really because life satisfaction is in fact what well-being is, although Richard Layard probably would say so, but rather because life satisfaction is something that we can measure quite well, at least in the opinion of these scholars. Uh, and so we should have, we should prioritize the maximization of life satisfaction and then government should do a lot of randomized controlled trials to identify what policy interventions work to improve life satisfaction, then do a bunch of cost-benefit analysis to figure out which of those high-impact things is the cheapest and then just fund the stuff that has the biggest impact. Pretty standard kind of what works logic. Uh, and I think this paper is... Um, dumb, basically. Like I, like partially, I think uh, you know, there is a, there is a scope for this sort of work in public policy. Like I think we should use life satisfaction more than we currently do. Um, I definitely think we should use way more randomized control trials than we currently do in general. Um, we should actually use less cost benefit analysis than we currently do, at least in the UK. Um, so that's kind of fine. But broadly, I think the idea that uh, like we should just sort of maintain this emphasis on cost benefit analysis, but instead of using income, we should use life satisfaction. That strikes me as batshit crazy, frankly. And I will explain why probably towards the end of the course when we do wellbeing policy, because that seems to be leading the polling at the moment. All right, so the thing I want to mention with respect to this week of the course is that these ideas that well-being, what makes someone's life go well, is that they are satisfied with it, that the government should try to improve their satisfaction with life, but not even really 
their satisfaction with life by asking them, are you satisfied with your life? What could we do to make it more satisfying? But instead to just ask them, how satisfied are you with your life on a scale from 1 to 10? And then never talk to them again. Then come over here to our spreadsheets and figure out, in our opinion, what's causing their well-being and just do that. And so really what we're trying to do is increase the numbers that they give on these scales, which I think is something quite different, actually, from trying to increase people's life satisfaction. But in any case, these claim, these are ends, life satisfaction, is very value-laden, very contested. Most philosophers do not like life satisfaction as a way of cashing out well-being. Uh, and the means by which we're going to achieve it, so doing a lot of cost-benefit analysis and randomized controlled trials, also highly contested and value-laden in the context of public management. Um, I think it's also the case that the accuracy of life satisfaction scales is a highly contested technical claim that a lot of the advocates of this sort of thing just like blow past. They don't engage with any of the critiques at all. Let me try to summarize those critiques for you very briefly. So here's what I mean by a life satisfaction scale question. So all things considered, how satisfied are you with your life overall on a scale from 0 to 10? Where you've got this other version, the Cantrell's Ladder of Life, Assume that this graphical image of a ladder is a way of picturing your life. The top of the ladder represents the best possible life for you. The bottom rung of the ladder represents the worst possible life for you. Indicate where on the ladder you feel you personally stand right now by marking the circle. Um, same sort of outcome, and we find that responses to these two questions are basically the same. So these two different phrasings don't seem to don't seem to change much. All right, now. There's tons of problems. I have a whole, I mean, this is like half the research that I do. Um, but I just give you one slide where I try to give you a picture of it that hopefully captures a lot of the issues. So this is the issue that got me first interested in this stuff. So on this graph here on the y-axis, you've got life satisfaction from less to more and I put numbers on it for the sake of making things easier to explain, but really we should think of this as a vector, just running from less to more. And zero is kind of like, I'm going to kill myself sort of thing. And then these red bars represent the person's actual scale that they use at that time. So in the first wave, their actual scale lines up perfectly with the numbers on the y-axis. The black line then is how satisfied they actually are with their life. And you can see that this person is broadly getting more satisfied with their life over time. Now, initially, everything's dandy. So they're about here, got their scale. They say they're 7 out of 10. That corresponds to the 7 on their scale. Everything's great. Then life gets a little bit better. They can still communicate that on the scale, no problem. They say they're 8 out of 10. Then in the third way, life keeps getting better. You know, this is what happens to, I think, a lot of graduates. You know, They come from middle-class backgrounds. Life's pretty good when they're growing up. Life's pretty good at university. And then, I don't know, they graduate into the job they want. They get promoted. They have more money. They're partying. They're enjoying themselves. Maybe they find a life partner. You know, this kind of stuff. Life just keeps getting better for a lot of people. So now, they're at the equivalent of their 10 out of 10 from the earlier waves. So you might think, well, they could just say they're 10 out of 10. But that would sort of imply that they're completely satisfied, that life couldn't get any better. But indeed, it could get better. They can see ways that it would get better. And also, now that they've sort of made this progress from time one to time three, they think there's less uncertainty about the future. You know, maybe here they weren't sure what kind of job they'd get when they graduate, but they actually got the job that they wanted. And so having gotten the job they wanted, they now think it's reasonable to expect that in five years' time they'll buy a house or something like that. And then their satisfaction will be even higher. So that uncertainty factor also comes into consideration. Now you might think, why over here, why didn't they say that they were 4 out of 10 or something? Well, maybe because they didn't want to seem, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, indulgent or something like that. You know, like life's good. I want, to t I want to communicate that life's good. And then it's just hard for me to communicate that life's getting better. So here, where life has gotten better to the point where it's now equivalent to 10 out of 10 on their earlier scales... They don't want to say they're 10 out of 10. So instead of changing the response category, they change the meaning of the points on their scale. So their scale has shifted up, or you could think of it as stretching. So this, this could stay at the bottom, and you could just stretch it out. 
In any case, this 8 out of 10 actually corresponds to a higher level of satisfaction with life than the 8 out of 10 at time 2. So we, the researcher, looking at these two 8s, think that nothing has improved in this person's satisfaction. But actually, they're markedly more satisfied with their life in time 3. Now, I think this is sort of capturing the problem that there's no reason to think that the meaning of the points on the scale is static over time. There's no good reason to think that different people use the scale in broadly the same way. Um, and then there's also this other problem that's much more technical, which is that people don't necessarily use the scale in the linear way, which means that, in a sense, like the amount of satisfaction you need to go from a 3 to a 4 is the same change in the am same amount of satisfaction as you need to go from a 7 to an 8. We actually find that that's not how people think. They tend to think more... Well, actually, there's a whole ton of different ways that they think about it. But in any case, they don't think about it linearly. But we standardly assume linear scale use in our statistical models. All right. So in any case, uh, I think that you can still use life satisfaction scales for a bunch of stuff. But they're very imprecise. And precisely what we need for cost-benefit analysis is precise instruments. So I think this whole idea of doing everything based on cost-benefit analysis is a bit of a non-starter. Um, Okay, so back to this slide. So um, there's this claim in this paper by these guys that life satisfaction scales and doing public policy in this way would actually be democratic because it lets people decide what matters to them. Um, I think this is bullshit because we never actually ask people what matters to them. We ask people what their life satisfaction is on a scale from 0 to 10 and then we go off and run our statistical models where we put in variables as causes of life satisfaction that we, the analysts, think is causing life satisfaction. We don't ask people directly. And when, you, when I confront my colleagues with this, they say, oh, well, but of course, Mark, we can't ask people directly because they have too many cognitive and behavioral biases. This is the thing we studied in the week on sociology and psychology from behavioral economics. This has been a bit of a disaster. You know? Behavioral economics should have made economists more humble. Instead, in a lot of ways, it's just given people an excuse to be even more dismissive uh, of people and, and even more focused on things that we can put in spreadsheets. And I think this is very much in line with the themes of the Critical Perspectives Week. So there's, we're kind of having less and less democracy here, even more power being hoarded by um, technical elites. Um, there's also this claim that uh, life satisfaction is correlated with uh, being re-elected, and so politicians should just promote life satisfaction. And then my, my sort of question here is, well, like, where is the politics in all of this? Like, what role do citizens have in this vision of public policy besides just reporting a number each year, right? Even their vote seems to be predetermined by analysis. Like, it seems to be a deterministic thing. Right, there's no discussion in this framework of legitimate political processes, only of legitimate scientific processes. There's only lip service to involving citizens in governance in any way whatsoever. Right? It's more, we're just going to promote life satisfaction. People will inevitably like that their life satisfaction is getting better and they'll vote for the government. They're not going to tell the government what to do. They're not going to tell the government what they care about, what they'd like to see changed in their life. The government's just going to improve their life satisfaction. Legitimacy in this framework is defined entirely in scientific terms. It's defined in terms of what measures of well-being are valid according to science, and that's where we get life satisfaction scales from, what methodologies are appropriate, and that's where we get this emphasis on experiments and cost-benefit analysis. All the institutions that are considered relevant to good policy in this paper are technocratic institutions. Right? Uh, aspects of the bureaucracy that are highly empowered uh, and aspects of the scientific community that have these relevant methods and can feed them into the bureaucracy. It's not even clear to me that there is any role for Parliament in this vision. Parliament will just like get a bunch of things from this little group of technical advisors, presumably in the Treasury, who tell them what to do, and Parliament will just go and do it. It's like completely technocratic, uh, and I think like in a really deeply problematic way. Why should we be concerned about technocracy? Well, I think right now we are living through an absolute high tide of populism, one not seen since 
the lead up to World War II, which I dare say was the darkest time in human history. So I'm a little bit concerned. Um, and I think populists have made great strides out of leveraging anti-elite sentiment. They're constantly talking about how people have lost power. We need to take back control from the bureaucrats. We've got this quote from Michael Gove. People are sick of experts from organizations with acronyms telling them what they should do and getting it consistently wrong. In the face of this, how can a bunch of people who want to promote well-being advocate for something so technocratic? There's a few other themes that I think are worth picking up here in terms of the relationship between technocracy and populism. So one is that uh, politicians have lost the kind of moral and political leadership element of their job. Politicians increasingly do politics by polling, so they just kind of check what people want, often on a week-to-week -week basis, day-to-day -day basis, and make their policy on that basis, which really makes it difficult to do kind of long-term, deep, well-thought-out policy, and especially makes it difficult to deal with complex, boring, hard-to-spin policy challenges like COVID. And then in those cases, politicians don't take moral and political leadership. So they don't take responsibility for their choices. They don't say the reason why we are going to um, lock down during Christmas is because we think that the spread of the virus over this time is, is just so great that it's not worth having people meet their family members at this culturally important time. Or alternatively say, you know, we're not going to lock down. We know that that will cause problems, but we think people should be able to see their family members over Christmas. You know, those are just strong moral claims and someone's got to take ownership of them. You can't say we're just following the science because as we discussed in the lecture, science is not capable of making those normative judgments. That's not what science is for. Science can't answer those kind of questions and expecting it to just really creates more hubris on the part of the academics and toxicifies the kind of work that scientists do. Uh, yeah, I've got one other thing to say here, which is that despite this kind of rising high tide of, of populism at the moment, I do not really see much effort among my colleagues to change the way that they do business. Um, yeah, there's still just a kind of overwhelming emphasis on looking at data about populists and seeing them as this weird puzzle to be solved, not as people who are feeling bad about their life. Um, we need to go and talk to these people and try to figure out how to solve things. Okay. Uh, now, uh, a kind of view that might challenge my concerns about technocracy is... is presented by Jason Brennan in this book, Against Democracy, where he argues for an epistocracy, which is that only informed people should be allowed to vote. Now, I've never met Jason, but I do get the sense from a lot of his work that he's a bit of a hot take artist. I'm not sure how much he kind of really genuinely believes in a lot of the stuff that he's putting out, but it's always quite thought-provoking, and he is an absolutely prolific uh, publisher. I think epistocracy is broadly stupid. Um, like, I'm sure Jason could defend himself very well, and he does have replies to a lot of these arguments, so if you're interested, you should go and read his book. Um, but yeah, generally, I'm just very sceptical of this idea that, like, informed people or knowledgeable people or educated people or however you want to cash this out really do genuinely do a better job than the public. So let's have a think about what would happen if we had philosophers in charge. So some of you might be PPE students, you might be doing philosophy, or you might already have had you know, your political theory courses, and you might have come across the sort of reasoning that philosophers engage in. And often what they do is they consult their intuitions. They say, well, this kind of feels wrong. Like It feels wrong to do um, technocracy, for example. The problem is that philosophers, by and large, are very, very weird people. I don't think there's any reason to think that the intuitions of analytical philosophers in perspective, in, in particular, who are uh, massively skewed towards the autism end of the spectrum relative to the public, I don't say it's because there's anything particularly wrong with being neurodivergent in that way. It's just that your views are not representative. So why would you think that 
you have a better handle on what's good than the public. So, okay, so philosophers, very weird bunch of people. Why would we expect them to know what's morally right? So you can be informed about something, but that doesn't make you informed necessarily about the appropriate value judgments. Knowledge about values is, by definition, diffuse through the public. I think also I just don't trust philosophers. I don't trust academics in general. So the first philosopher, Plato, when, oh, I mean, he wasn't quite the first, but he was very early on in the piece, wasn't he? When Plato was asked to come up with the ideal society, when he wrote The Republic, what did he do? He said, well, the good society should, of course, be run by the philosopher kings, because we're the only pure, sensible people. So essentially, when asked who should be in charge, he said, well, I should be in charge. I mean, this is ridiculous. Like, people will always think that they're pure and everyone else is a scumbag. But in fact, there is plenty of empirical evidence, and I talked about this a bit last year when we did corruption as, as one of our chosen policy challenges. Plenty of evidence that, barring very, very few kind of magical people like George Washington, pretty much everyone is corrupted by power. Pretty much everyone uh, kind of tends to be a bit scummy when they have the opportunity to be a bit scummy with no consequences. And knowledge really seems to be a very, very weak check on immorality. If you're interested particularly in corrupt people and the way corrupt people affect politics and policy, then I strongly suggest this book that's very well written, very readable, Corruptible by Brian Class, who's uh, at KCL in London. I also think that education, in the sense of a sort of elite education, like if you went to Cambridge or whatever, is a pure proxy for wisdom, ability, effort, ethics, etc. In fact, in my experience, having taught at Cambridge and having interacted with a lot of people from Harvard and these kind of institutions, as much as you do get a very high concentration of super impressive people at those kind of institutions, the higher you get in society the more you rise up and you come across the CEOs and the top politicians and the professors and all the rest of it, the more you are going to come across psychopaths. Psychopaths have an amazing ability to rise up organizational ranks because they're scrupulous. Sorry, in, inscrupulous. Is the word I'm looking for? They're not scrupulous. Yes, they have no ethics, right? <laughs> Okay, so I really don't think uh, that looking at someone as elite tells you that they're someone that you should give power to. In fact, the more elite someone is, the more suspicious I am of them and the less likely I, I am to want to give them power. I think also education is, as I say, a poor proxy for wisdom, like a poor proxy for a lot of things that we would associate with intelligence. So if you read uh, Philip Tetlock's Super Forecasters, which is a book on prediction, and the, the fact that a lot of these kind of so-called pundits, like people that make predictions about politics and that sort of thing on cable news networks, um, tend to be very bad at prediction. And he tries to come up with some way to test uh, and figure out how it is that we can become good at, at um, prediction. He finds that, yeah, that, I mean, there is a correlation between being intelligent, being educated and being able to make predictions. But actually, uh, the kind of opening line of the book is that uh, most um, experts are no better than random uh, at making predictions. And finally, there's this like, quite large literature on the wisdom of crowds. So um, what's the classic example? It's like if you have one of these contests where there's like a big jar of, um, of marbles or whatever and you have to guess how many marbles there are in the jar or how heavy a cow is or something like that and then the person with the closest guess wins the cow. Um, all the people guess different things. But if you take the average of all the guesses, it tends to be remarkably close to what the actual answer is. Uh, and this has been replicated sort of over and over again and is sometimes referred to as the wisdom of crowds. So uh, as a group, we often are wiser than as individuals. And that's really kind of one of the magical things about democracies, that we leverage kind of group wisdom. Okay, um, I think the last thing to mention here is that more educated people tend to be better at convincing themselves of their moral fortitude. And there's this really interesting finding in Jonathan Haidt's The Righteous Mind, which I think I said in one of the seminars, I think is, if there's one book you read as an undergrad, it should be that book. Um, it's about morality and, and a bunch of... It's, the subtitle is Why Good People Disagree About Religion and Politics. It's just a really excellent book. Really kind of will chill you out a lot. 
um, when it comes to kind of arguing with people about things. And I think we'll just kind of make you see the world in a more penetrating way. But in any case, one of the things that he points out there is that uh, moral reasoning seems to have evolved to help us convince other people of our moral positions, not to help us better investigate our own views. Right? So it's not the case that someone with really good moral reasoning is going to be a moral paragon. It's going to be that they are very good at convincing other people that they are a moral paragon. So again, you should be very uh, on your guard around these sort of people. All right, so against epistocracy, against technocracy. Let's now look at kind of the high tide of technocracy and why a lot of people think technocracy today is good. So we're going to look at neoliberalism, which had a lot of bad things to it, but also had a lot of very good things to it. So what is neoliberalism? So it's broadly a kind of period in time. So the neoliberal era in the OECD, the kind of rich nations of the West, runs from about 1980 to 2010, uh, or to 2016, I think you could say, so until Brexit and Trump. Uh, some people say it's still going on now. I kind of think we're more in this kind of interim period where what comes after neoliberalism hasn't quite emerged yet, but neoliberalism does seem to be kind of dead. It's a bit zombie. Um, a lot of stuff was going on during neoliberalism, but a big one is that uh, many, many countries, particularly a lot of these OECD nations, put, undertook what's called structural adjustment in the 1980s. So prior to that, the welfare state was very government-led. So there were a lot of price controls, a lot of subsidies. Uh, a lot of price controls of very fundamental things like wages were centrally set, stuff like that. And we had this very troubling macroeconomic phenomenon in the late 1970s called stagflation, where you had high inflation, high unemployment, and high interest rates. Absolutely horrible trifecta. Uh, and the solution seemed to be a bunch of microeconomic reforms to allow market forces to allocate capital, labor, management expertise, these kind of things, rather than having the government do it. It did seem to work hard to establish causation there. Uh, but because it was kind of broadly successful in advanced nations, and particularly not in the UK and the US, so I will talk about the UK and the US in a second, but it was very successful in Australia, very successful in Denmark, Canada, Germany, other places like that. As a result, a lot of these international organizations that are controlled by advanced nations like the IMF and the World Bank started to impose this same sort of structural adjustment logic onto developing countries, and there, because the political institutions were not anywhere near as far along as in the advanced nations, these structural adjustment policies were broadly disastrous. I could easily give a whole course, I think, on structural adjustment lending in developing countries, so I won't go into more detail than that, but it was a very kind of heady time for uh, economists because they seem to be involved in everything. Right, so that was the neoliberal period, but then what is neoliberalism about? Well, one way of thinking about it is that if liberalism is the idea that markets are good and freedom is good, then neoliberalism is the idea that governments are the problem. Neoliberalism is also, under a different definition that's a bit more precise, a bit more technical, the extension of economic logic to non-economic domains. So things like the household, things like how government commissions services, this kind of stuff. Okay, so how did this manifest in public policy? So as I said, the big one uh, is kind of the commercialization and marketization of policy areas that were previously managed by the state or the community. So things like social care, things like health, although the UK has really held on to public health care, perhaps not for the best. Education, garbage collection, which is one area where it works really well. And we're going to talk about this a lot more when we do bureaucracy and commissioning in, in the main course. Uh, another thing that you see is the utilization of quite crude rational choice theory principles in administrative design. So the idea is that bureaucrats, teachers, nurses, other people who deliver public services are very self-interested. They're not doing it because they want to make a positive contribution to society um, and we need to be really careful about them kind of parasiting on the public purse. So we need strong accountability. And the way we're going to do that is to use performance metrics. And this idea is less from economics and more from management science, which is a very dark science, uh, in my opinion. 
But uh, nonetheless, you can see some aspects of economics here as well. Uh, typically, the 1980s and neoliberalism in public management saw the use of market mechanisms wherever possible, and this includes financialization, um, not just uh, kind of rational choice theory and, and that sort of stuff. Like a lot of it was about yeah, debt, uh, so pushing things that risk that had previously been socialized, so ha handled by the state, was then pushed onto individuals instead. And generally, policy making was individualized. So personal responsibility was a real mantra. User pays became a very common piece of logic. And a kind of general manifestation of, of neoliberalism is that a lot of things do become cheaper under neoliberalism, like Ryanair. Ryanair is a very easy example, I guess, to work with. A lot of things become cheaper, but that's because a lot of the uh, burdens are pushed onto the consumer. So like when you go to Ryanair, the airline hasn't had a good old think about what would make for a good flight, like maybe some food here, maybe a chair that gives you a little bit more leg room, whatever. Instead, you, the consumer, can pick all the different things that you want. And that means that the ticket can be really cheap. But it also means that you have to go through so much more of a cognitive process in order to buy your airline ticket. Uh, and maybe for airline tickets, this is fine. But if you think about your visit to the hospital for complex uh, health services over the course of a year because you need a knee reconstruction or something, then maybe you don't actually want this kind of approach because there's a lot of stuff there that you just don't understand and the cognitive burden of that is going to be really taxing on you. All right, so we've covered kind of what neoliberalism is about. Was it bad? So I want to start by saying like, no, it's not. Uh, like, I think you, you might get... In a lot of your other courses, this like straightforward claim that neoliberalism was just shit. Um, I actually think that on balance, it was pretty good. Um, part of the problem or part of the reason why you often hear in, in UK institutions that it was bad is because neoliberalism was prosecuted by Margaret Thatcher and by the Reagan administration in the US in a very ideological way, in, way that, in ways that often was not informed by economics. So, for example, the privatising of the railways that I talked about in week three, that's not economically sensible. That's just a kind of ideological belief that governments suck and that markets and private organisations would do a better job without any kind of real reasoning around why that might be the case. Um, but in countries like, as I said, Australia, Denmark, Sweden, um, the these reforms were prosecuted often by left-wing governments that were actually kind of sceptical of markets, um, but led by technical experts to do it in quite a wise way. Uh, and I think the Blair government would have done this if it hadn't come after the Thatcher government. So Thatcher shifted the Overton window, which is the, the kind of space of political possibility, so far to the right and so far in favour of markets that it was then very hard for... Um, left-wing administrations that came after that to bring it back to somewhere sensible. And that's what you see with Bill Clinton in the US as well. Whereas I think in countries like Australia and Denmark and stuff, um, now they're, they're just having this, this much more kind of sensible middle ground between government and market, and government and market tend to be blended a lot more in their public policy. And I think they have achieved in those countries broadly sustained growth over the last 40 years with quite a lot of equity as well. Whereas in the UK and the US, you did see growth until round about the global financial crisis in 2009, but you also saw just massive explosions in inequality and a lot of kind of carnage around uh, markets that were not being used effectively. So things like the railways having chronic underinvestment because you've privatised them. Um, and so railway tickets are really expensive and the firms aren't using those revenues to invest in the railways, they're just pocketing the profits. That's the kind of thing we'd expect if you did market adjustment in a dumb way. There's also a couple of countries that didn't do market adjustment at all. So France and Japan basically didn't bother with it, and they have, well, I mean, I think the French and especially the Japanese don't necessarily think that things have turned out that badly, um, but it's certainly the case that they've had uh, much more lacklustre growth over the last... 40 years and continue to be hamstrung by a lot of the stuff that was problematic in the late 70s, like very high youth unemployment rates in particular. So in France, youth unemployment is like at minimum 15%, something like that. Um, okay, so 
Uh, that's kind of the good side of neoliberalism, but then there's also this bad side. Um, and I think most of the bad side of neoliberalism, particularly the manifestations that we've seen in recent years, like the Rust Belt in America that elected Donald Trump, pertain to the fact that neoliberalism was really about economics, so economics becoming a very powerful force in government uh, and having a very big influence over policy design. So all that stuff I mentioned in week two about, week three, sorry, about market distortions, market failures, hybrid logics, that all became very powerful in the 80s. But that way of thinking, which I know very well, I wrote a book on it about how great it is, um, that way of thinking uh, is basically oblivious to the complexities of human psychology, the complexities of human culture, society, all the things that sociology, political science, and psychology do in anthropology, right? So the other social sciences. And a lot of that stuff is assumed out of economic models because, as we talked about in week two, we want those models to be simplified and tractable. But humans are more complicated, so... Sometimes when we assume these things out, they come back later to bite us in the ass. I think that's basically what's uh, been happening in a lot of cases. And economics has been struggling to keep up. Um, okay, so yeah, all this naivety towards community heritage, etc. has directly contributed to, for example, the deindustrialization of the north of England, the de deindustrialization of the Rust Belt and the Appalachian regions in America. And that's where a lot of this populist sentiment has come from. Um, and I think this is, you know, it's really easy to trace this to technocrats who had blind faith in economic models. So Alan Greenspan, who was the former chair of the Federal Reserve in America, he was very explicit about this. He, when the GFC happened, he was like, oh, I can't believe this happened. I thought banks would be self-interested and they wouldn't behave this way. Which I, I just thought was crazy to hear, hear that. <laughs> like, oh, banks aren't greedy. Um... Another thing that's happened a lot is that the management by metrics and the commercialization of interpersonal relationships that we've seen under neoliberalism and which I discussed a bit, which I will discuss in the bureaucracy week. And if you're interested, and I did discuss a bit in the critical perspectives lecture. And if you're interested in listening further, you should listen to the podcast on the Moodle from Cassie Thornton on social technologies of care for unlearning capitalism. A lot of these things bear significant responsibility for the disintegration of social policy and other care sectors in advanced nations. So we, yeah, it's, it's, it's very hard for people to feel taken care of. Um, and what we get nowadays is a lot of bad care, which is this kind of commercialized care where you like pay for stuff and then someone does take care of you, but it's very sort of impersonal and there doesn't seem to be that emotional interpersonal human element to care anymore. Um, and I think, yeah, basically all these things are expectable, predictable consequences of technocratic hubris. Neoliberalism is also in some ways the kind of last apex articulation of bourgeois, Calvinist, American capitalist values masquerading as social science. And Thatcher and Reagan were very explicit about that. But some of the academics who are involved, like Friedman, Hayek, Larry Summers, Richard Layard here in the UK, not so much. I mean, Richard, I think, in particular, really sees himself as uh, kind of a champion of, of kind of left-wing ideals and this kind of thing. But Richard's main claim to fame, as I understand it, is the uh, requirement to look, to look for work if you're on unemployment benefits, which I think has created just catastrophic amounts of misery and is clearly a... Uh, manifestation of Calvinist Protestant values. All right, um, let's look at another example that I, I presume you guys can wrap your heads around uh, of neoliberalism in public policy um, and kind of how it relates to these themes from the critical perspectives week. I apologize that all these slides are just like text, but I guess I'm, I don't want to put that much effort into these bonus lectures. All right, so... I think broadly speaking, when we think of education, it's something like, what does it mean to get educated? Uh, I, would, I would lean towards something like uh, getting the skills, broadly speaking, technical skills, emotional skills, social skills, whatever it might be, to allow you to flourish. Uh, if you're an artist, that means developing the skills in your art. If you are uh, going to be management consultant, then that means 
getting literacy and numeracy. I think that uh, what we have in contemporary education policy, particularly in the UK, is a situation where education prepares people for work, not for life, and for a very particular kind of work, for management consulting type work, not for creative work or care work or anything of that sort. I think it really prepares people to have their value extracted by some capitalist organisation rather than to have that person blossom into a full human being through life. I think particularly the, the way the higher education system is structured so that people get into quite a lot of debt very early on in life makes them very easy to control, makes them very risk averse because they have to worry about staying on a particular track in order to pay off that debt, get a mortgage, that sort of thing. And that makes them very risk averse and that makes them generally prefer the status quo. They don't want to shake things up. They also tend to be desperate for high paid jobs. That makes it easier to convince them that parasitic actors in our society, like hedge funds, consultancies, politicians, auditors, etc., are actually very prestigious and valuable firms that you really want to go to work for. Um, I don't want to dump too much on consultancies, but Perhaps if you are thinking of going to work for a consultancy, maybe first just read this book by Rariana Mazzucato and Rosie Collington called The Big Con, which kind of really goes to show, and I guess I broadly agree with their thesis, that consultancies have kind of systematically debased government in advanced nations over the last 15 years and are basically just like robbing the public purse. Anyway, another point that's important to mention is that people who are racing to get ahead to kind of move up on their career ladder, um, become uh, successful, make money, this kind of thing, and in many ways I'm no different, don't have time for politics. They're too focused on their career. They certainly don't have time for their communities. They don't have time to do volunteering, to get involved in what's happening on the street because they're just always at the office. Another problem with the neoliberalisation of education, and by that I particularly mean um, the emphasis on PISA scores, as measures of literacy and numeracy, and PISA is a ranking. So the only way to go up in that ranking is for some other country to go down. And because you're not measuring, for example, mental health, in order to go up, you have to overtake the Asian nations. And the Asian nations almost all have cram schools, like the cultures of being at school for like 10 hours a day. Mental health in those countries is not good. And students are often not blossoming beyond literacy and numeracy, right? Particularly, a lot of kids aren't doing that much PE, physical ed, right? So if we're thinking about a rich education to help us flourish as people, it might be the case that the Asian system is fine in many ways, but we want something broader than literacy and numeracy as a ranking. Now, if you force people to do well on the PISA rankings, then you're preventing teachers who often got into the business in order to help people get educated in the broad sense. You're preventing them from teaching in the way that they would like to teach. You're forcing them to teach in a much narrower way. And it's very well documented that this has been hugely demoralizing for teachers. It's very hard to keep teachers in the industry. They tend to leave in droves. And it also makes a much more antagonistic relationship between teachers and the bureaucrats who are responsible for organizing their sector. And finally, because we create this kind of culture of competitiveness and getting ahead in education, and we create all these league tables and stuff that people don't understand very well, there is an incentive created to have fee-paying education. Uh, I can't go into too much detail on this, but there's like really quite good studies that I think I've mentioned elsewhere in the course showing that once you control for family background, particularly for the income of your parents, the literacy and numeracy effect of private education disappears. But when people are looking at league tables, they just see that the private school, the fee-paying school, does better than the poor kid's school. It's not because the school's better, it's because the parents are richer, if I'm speaking very crudely, right? But then people are like, oh, I have to send my kids there. Uh, And then they're going to pay money for that, and they're not going to care anymore about what's going on in state schools. And that really kind of, again, further undermines the kind of social fabric because it leads to more uh, bifurcation of our society along economic class lines and generally exacerbates inequality. Um, So, as I said, everything on that previous slide is the result of deliberate policy choices. 
For example, the strict focus in schools on literacy and numeracy, evaluating students' literacy and numeracy through PISA ranking, and encouraging teaching to the test to improve that ranking, higher education financing being structured in a way that increases high prices and debt, particularly because there's this very strong emphasis on UK universities to be research hubs, even though we just like don't need that many people doing academic research, and there could be much more of a focus on teaching, and then the price of having teaching-focused academics is much lower than the price of having research-focused academics. You also have very ham-fisted regulation of a lot of education groups. Ofsted is, is a trash or just, well, no, that's too far. Ofsted has a lot of problems. The way that universities are regulated, like the uh, education research, uh, the TEF, what is that? The Teaching Excellence Framework and the Research Excellence Framework are really bad and they have this kind of whole proliferation of parasitic actors who are just kind of there to run bureaucratic compliance on universities um, and don't actually produce anything themselves except paperwork about what the universities are producing. So this is all just very wasteful in the manner that we discussed in the, in the seminar on, on the rent-seeking game. Um, and then we also have this problem that uh, there's all these research requirements on universities that conflate the educational value of the university with the research quality of the staff. So students will often be like, oh, well, I should go to that university because it's ranked really highly. But that ranking comes from the research the university does, not the teaching that the university does. It's much harder to report on the quality of the teaching. Okay. Well, I think I'm done. All right, well, that was a bit rambly at times, but uh, this, the nature of these bonus lectures is that they're kind of a bit more high level and a bit more just kind of stream of consciousness stuff coming out of my brain. But I hope it was interesting, and uh, I'll put this up, and I'll see you guys in the next lecture.